Hello, welcome back to Making Sense of Money, a podcast about making financial topics easy to understand. I'm Andrew Pellegrini. Last episode, we talked about the basics of home buying. So if you missed it and you're considering purchasing a home right now, go check it out. And I am Nikki Giancola Shanks. And this episode, we're going to continue talking about housing issues, but specifically talk about renting. And talk about the differences in renting versus buying a home and the steps you need to take to start renting if it's new to you. And I'm Jake Hamilton. So as the only current renter among our three hosts, I will go ahead and kick off this discussion. Andrea and Nikki, when was the last time that each of you rented before you purchased your homes? And what do you remember about renting? I can go first. This is Andrea. Um, so the last two rental situations I was in before buying a home, I basically rented rooms from my friends who were homeowners. So where I lived with two separate um, married couples at different times. Um, they owned their own homes, So it was all like on an honor system. I didn't have to sign a lease. I paid my rent in cash <laughs> for them. Um, but, but prior to that, I also rented apartments with someone else on a lease by myself, and I had a sublet. The last person that I was on a lease with didn't always pay their half of the rent. And unfortunately, with the way that the lease was actually rented, um, I had to pay all the rent those months. So I think if you're looking to sign a lease with someone else, make sure to pay particularly close attention to the way that the lease is written so that you're not stuck paying all the rent if someone loses a job or is unreliable. Yeah, that's a horrible situation. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about like reading through your lease completely a little bit later on. But yeah, that's, I mean, you hear some rental horror stories sometimes, but that one's pretty rough. Nikki what, about, Nikki, what about you? What, how's your how's your renting experience been throughout your life? So I'm going to be honest. I haven't rented since college. I only was a renter for two years. So um, I rented my junior year and my senior year of college. Um, both t- They were with the same roommates, different apartments. Well, the, so the first year, my junior year, there was five of us in one apartment. And then the second year, it was three of the five and not because we had a bad lunching experience at all. It was just, you know, somebody was on the rugby team, was going to go live with the rugby team. So, you know, like stuff like that. So I've never had a very bad renting experience because that's my only renting experience. For me, what I would say is, so after college, I went home, I lived there for a little bit. We had a friend of the family who was selling a townhouse and my cousin and I co-bought the townhouse together and we lived together for 12 years. I think it was 12 before I got married and moved in with, and we, and my husband and I bought a house. My only um, thing about that is I think we know more now than we did, Um, you know, at the time. Christina's older than me. She's one of my best friends. She's like a sister to me. So she was like, let's do this. Like, neither of us want to be living at home, you know, like, let's do this. And I was like, all right. And she's like, and then in a few years, we'll be able to sell it or make a profit. I mean, all a hundred percent true in 2007 and then 2008 recession hit. So um yeah so it was just one of those things when 2008 hit we just would always joke we're like oh so we're gonna like die at this house together (laughs) like now we're stuck here together forever um and yeah so it it uh my my caution between renting versus buying is just make sure you're really ready to buy before you do it because you don't know what's going to happen. 
I wouldn't trade my experience because it was at least with somebody who I love and I'm very close with and we could like maneuver our way through any sticky points that we had because there are right whenever you live with someone there's like the growing pains of living together but um again very good experiences overall but my thing is buying I think as a society I think we're told like buy a house build your wealth like do and sometimes I think especially if you're younger you need to like take a step back and be like am I really ready for that right now and really think about it so that's why I'm I'm happy we're doing this podcast because I think um you know my life personally went in a totally different direction I was a teacher when I bought that house and then since then I've worked in um, political campaigns and in state government. So like, you just don't know. So that's my renting, yeah, that's, I guess, experience. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I had no idea any of this happened to you, Nikki. Um, but yeah, that's a really great point. And we're going to talk about, we're going to discuss some of the differences between renting and buying and what makes it right for you and what makes, you know, buying right for somebody or renting right for somebody. Um, after listening to you guys, I think, I feel comfortable saying that I might be the most experienced with renting among our uh, among um, our hosts. Even though I'm, I'm the youngest of the three of us, uh, I have I have been renting. I've been renting since college. Um, I've been renting since college, and I'm 30 now. So I've been renting for I guess you know over 10 years. I've done renting with college roommates. I've lived on my own. I've done subleases. I have done an agreement, like a short-term three-month agreement with somebody I met off Craigslist. I have lived with like a friend who owned a house and did like no lease signing. I have uh, leased uh, apartments with my significant other. Um, And right now I'm even going through the process of breaking a lease and signing a new one due to some unfortunate housing circumstances. So I think I've seen in my in my short time renting in this last decade, I think I have seen a lot of aspects of the all the different things that can happen to you when you're renting. Um, so, yeah, uh, I've I've been through a lot on the renting side of stuff. So, uh, but I'm glad we're talking about it because I think a lot of people do rent, and especially with like the housing market the way it is in the U.S. currently, you know, it can be difficult for people to get to the point where they are comfortable or are able to like buy a home and plant those roots, so to speak. I see some reactions on your guys' faces. <laughs> well, I just want to say, I, I, if you could see our facial expression expressions, Andrea and I are chuckling to ourselves because um, we are very lucky that the three of us are podcast hosts together, but we've also become pretty good friends. So <laughs> Andrea and I have uh, witnessed the drama of Jake's uh, latest rental uh experience and I feel like we're like the two older sisters being like uh where are you living what is it safe are you okay (laughs) well I agree Jake you definitely have the most experience like I thought I had a pretty varied experience in the like I guess seven-ish years that I um rented but you have a lot more variety of experiences than I do yeah, I always get a pretty good reaction when I tell people that I have like multiple times found roommates from Craigslist. Um, like one time, the uh, yeah, this is going to sound crazy, but when I was uh, looking for an apartment in grad school, I found a sublease off of Craigslist. Worked out great. Uh, that one worked out great. And then when I moved to Chicago for the first time, uh, I needed like a temporary I need like a temporary housing solution because I had planned on moving in with like one of my friends, but not until like three months after I was moving to the city and starting work. Uh, And so I saw his ad on Craigslist, uh, went up and met the guy, signed up. He didn't make me sign anything. And I just paid him. I Venmoed him for um, for our lease. That worked out great, too. I didn't get murdered. So I I think that one was a win. I feel like Uh, you're so lucky you haven't run into scams on Craigslist. Maybe, uh, I don't know. I guess I just have good luck. <laughs> I guess so. But uh, so let's actually dive in. Um, we're going to talk about the steps to renting first, and then we're going to talk about some of um, like Nikki and Andrea's perspectives on home buying since they have both have experience with that. And then we're going to talk about like the difference uh, between renting and buying. So 
let's dive into what you actually need to do when you're planning on renting an apartment or a home. Remember, it's apartments aren't the only thing that you can rent. You can you can rent a house or a condo or some other type of domicile. Um, and I'll stipulate up front that this isn't going to be a completely exhaustive list, but these are some common steps to take when you consider finding a new home to rent. So number one, I would recommend, and I think our hosts would agree, uh, that you should check your credit first. Most rental applications are going to require a credit check, and landlords may want to see that you have a minimum level of a credit score before they would accept your application. So like for me recently, um, the you know place that um, I most recently moved into was like a 640 minimum credit score. And then this new lease that I'm getting into as I move out of my current place is like a 650 minimum credit score. So you just want to, I think it's, it's good to be cognizant of your credit score when you go into these decisions and know kind of what you're going to be able to qualify for. And we did a whole podcast on credit. So you can understand there's multiple scores and where to go to check your credit. Yeah, Absolutely. That's like one of our first episodes we talked about credit. So you have to go way back, but it's definitely in there. Number two, I would say save for security deposit and miscellaneous moving costs. We're gonna talk a little bit more about these different types of costs later, um, but there are a lot of upfront costs that are involved when you move into an apartment or home or rent a home. Um, so it's something that you wanna be prepared for like a big cost all at once. And so it's something you might wanna save for. And along those lines, number three, I would say set a budget. It's important to know how much you want to spend on your monthly housing costs and how much you want to spend on rent before you go start looking at apartments. Typically, uh, landlords may require you to have three times the monthly rent gross income. Um, so your income before your taxes are taken out. We've talked about that on the taxes episode before too. Um, so this might be a good start for putting a limit on how much you can spend on rent um, or or just to get an idea of your head of like what your ceiling for rent is going to be, it's probably going to be about a third of your monthly income. Um, but you might want to aim for lower than that. It depends on kind of, we've talked about this before, but the cost of living varies widely depending on where you live. So um, you just kind of have to factor all those things into your budget. And then I would say step number four, after you kind of figure out the financial aspects of it, is to go actually look at apartments. Um, so like we talked about with home buying, this can be one of the more fun or stressful parts of the process, depending on the type of person you are or the stage of your life that you're in. I know like recently in January, I moved to a new city. I was three hours away from where I was moving. It was kind of stressful for us to go look at apartments that were three hours away. Like we had to book as many appointments as we could on a Saturday that we could drive up and like see people and see all these apartments. And then we didn't get to as many as we wanted. And then you kind of feel rushed because you can only see a limited amount of apartments in person. Um, so that was kind of stressful, but I've also had like really enjoyable apartment finding experiences before where you get to look at different apartments. And I'll say you could do a lot of your upfront research online. You might even be able to do like virtual tours of some places. And there's a lot of ways to approach this process. You can even have like a realtor or a real estate agent help you locate apartments that fit your budget. Sometimes like a leasing agent for different apartment companies will give you tours of like a bunch of different units. And like real estate agents, in my experience, will often do this work for free or they get like some kind of fee for referring you and they don't charge you anything. And they might want to establish a relationship with you for like down the road if you ever do want to buy a home. Um, so sometimes real estate agents will like help you find places to live um, for free when you're looking for like an apartment or a home to rent. I'll also add... Um, and these are like popular ones. These are common ones. There's other ones out there, but online websites like apartments.com, Redfin, Zillow, for example, can be good for finding places to look at. But I will also say that the information on those may not always be completely up to date. Like sometimes you might see an apartment or a home listed on one of these websites and it might not even be available. But if you reach out to somebody like the leasing agent for that place, they can they might reach back out to you and say, hey, like this unit isn't available but we know we have a bunch of other units that are available that are similar to this. We can show you these. Um, and if you, like I said, if you get in touch with the leasing agent, they may know of like websites that are more specific to the local market that you're searching in. Like those are the generic ones I gave you, but like I live in the Chicago area now and there's a bunch of like websites that are specific to Chicago apartments, for example. Uh, I'll also say virtual tours can be useful, but it may be more beneficial to go look at places in person if you can. Oftentimes like, 
the pictures of places that you'll see online are going to be like perfect and dressed up, or they might even be a model unit. It might not be the actual physical unit that you would be living in. So it's really important to go see places in person and kind of get in, see all the nooks and crannies, like get an actual feel for the space and like how your stuff is going to fit in there. And, um, you know, what it's going to be like for you to live there. You might also be able to find like minor things or like issues with the apartment that you wouldn't see online. Um, so I would recommend going to see stuff in person if at all possible and bring a tape measure and know how big your furniture is. I think that's always useful too. That's something I would recommend. Another part of this is when you go look at places in person, you're also going to want to try and ask a lot of questions when you go there to like the leasing agent or whoever's showing you the apartment. Uh, you can ask questions about the place that you're looking at. You can ask questions about the area, the parking, the neighborhood, the building, move-in fees, you know, recreation centers that are nearby, restaurants that are nearby, and any other things that you would want to know about for like when you're moving to a new, new place. Uh, and I'd also say this is where you would look for red flags for potential rental scams or like issues with the building that may show up. Um, you're going to want to research like the rental company, make sure it's legitimate, beware of like too good to be true features or costs. And don't use, when, whenever you sign up for this stuff, you know, we've discussed this before with other scams, but you don't want to use cash or wire transfers or gift cards to pay. You're going to want to make sure it's like an official payment um, and make sure like it's going to the right place. You can even like do a test payment first. Like I've had things where like, it might be like a singular landlord and not like an official company. And like to make sure that you're sending money to the right person you might send like a dollar first and then confirm it with that person. And then you can send the rest of the money afterwards after you've confirmed the, the money is going to the right place. And for the sake of the listeners not having to listen to me ramble on for much longer, I will pass it over to Nikki for the rest of the steps. You're so funny, Jake. Um, now you guys can listen to me ramble. <laughs> So in continuing uh, kind of the, the list of steps that you need to go through. So now you should be at the, if you followed all of the steps so far that Jake talked about um, and you found a home that you really like to rent, um, the next step is that you have to apply for the home that you rent. Depending on the requirements of that particular either individual landlord or a renting a rental company, um, you may need to provide several different pieces of information. Um, it usually can involve a background or a credit check. Um, you may have to submit things like uh, proof of income. Uh, it, that could even be like a current pay stub. I I've known friends who have used that, or you know like. You may have to put down reference of your current employer so they could call and make and ask if you're still employed, et cetera. And then if you are accepted by your landlord slash rental company, um, they will provide you with a lease. And it is very important that you review it. Um, and I always think it's a good idea to have somebody else look at it too, just in general with paperwork. So whether that's a trusted advisor, um, if you have a lawyer that you regularly work with for whatever reason, or a family member that you know, or a friend that you trust, um, just kind of look it over with you. Um, and you need to read everything completely. <laughs> um, it is a legal document. So once you sign it, that's it. Um, to break it, which you, Jake has some experience with now, um, requires a lot of steps uh, that it's not as easy. You can't just walk away from it. So make sure you're really reading everything. And then the last step is, well, second to last step is really to secure renter's insurance and other things you may need to move. It's important to protect yourself from risk with renter's insurance, and your landlord may even require you to have renter's coverage. Some do, some do not. Um, make sure that would be a question that you'd want to ask when you're looking at apartments. Um, you could shop around for coverage you want with different insurance companies, but typically renter's 
typically renters insurance is pretty affordable. Um, other expenses. Maybe yeah, I do. Same- Go ahead. Oh, Jake. Sorry. sorry. I was just going to cut in real quick. I was going to say uh, with the breaking the lease thing. Yeah. Just, um, you know, you can be communicative with your, like your leasing company, your landlords, like the one that I've, you know, they didn't get put up too much of a fight, you know, because they didn't have much, like if it would, I didn't want to go to court with anybody or anything, but they didn't put up too much of a fight because, you know, this was kind of their fault. And then on the rental, rental insurance thing too, I would just recommend like from someone who sold a lot of renters policies to people in the past when I was selling insurance, like you probably want to be like, your policy shouldn't cost more than like 10 to $20 a month is what I would recommend. If you're paying for more than that, then you're probably getting coverage that you don't need. And it might depend on the area that you're in. It might be like $25, but definitely mm-hmm. should be pretty nominal in comparison. It should be, it should be pretty affordable. Like you shouldn't mm-hmm. be paying, you know, hundreds of a hundred dollars a month or Absolutely. something like that for rental insurance. Definitely be on the lookout for that. Yeah. Um, you may also want other expenses around this time in the search, uh, maybe things like a moving company, a moving truck, um, recruit or recruiting your friends to help you do it for free with the promise of pizza. (laughs) Um, But planning for those types of expenses as well. And then the last step is to finally move in and unpack. So that all seems simple enough. There's a lot of steps, but the moving and finding a place to rent can definitely be that complicated process. So we've kind of gone over. Uh, It's really important when you're going through this process to give yourself plenty of time to take all the steps that you need to take in order to get into a new place and uh, make sure that you're allowing enough time to analyze all these different options to avoid scams. Uh, I have heard of a lot of students that run into scams when searching for rental properties. Obviously, I work with students mostly, and some of them can't come here to physically see the um, places that they're trying to rent. So you hear of someone paying the security deposit and first or second month's rent for a place that doesn't exist. And you hear about that even in some other communities, not just in my community. So it's important to give yourself enough time to do due diligence on uh, where you're trying to live. And generally, you want to start this process two or three months before your expected move out day or where you need to be in somewhere. However, in some communities, you might need to start this process a year early. For instance, in Champaign-Urbana, leases get signed in fall for the following fall. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a I great point. That. I remember that. Yeah. I graduated it, from U of I. A lot of, a lot of college campuses operate that way. They have like really long turnaround times. Like they try to get people to sign up for the next year. Um, But the other thing uh, I'll say on this too, is if you're not like on a college campus or if you're just in like a more normalized market, uh, typically like uh, leasing companies won't start showing like homes or apartments until like two or three months before they know it'll be available. So at that two to three month mark is about where you can expect to start seeing places that will be available when you're ready to move out. But we talked about saving too. So, and you can start saving for this like a year ahead of time or, you know, however long you need. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think, I think two to three months is, is a good idea of like when you can start looking for a new place. Yeah, I think that's good. We have the context of normal markets, right? Jake's lived in normal markets. I primarily just lived in the college market. Um, And I've also heard of students signing multiple leases for the same time frame, which is why we really emphasize the fact that leases are legal documents. You don't want to sign multiple ones at the same time. So like Jake mentioned, you may want to start saving for moving past prior to when you move, obviously. And after securing your rental, uh, there's some costs that come with that. Some of those potential costs are a security deposit, which you would have to pay usually at signing of your lease to your landlord to cover any potential damages to your unit while you're living there. You can sometimes get this back uh, when you move out. 
it might be the full amount or partial amount, but you just got to take good care of the uh, unit that you'll be living in. You also might have move-in fees. Sometimes a landlord charges a move-in fee, which could be used to cover damages, but are typically not refundable. There might also be pet rent or additional pet security deposit fees, which covers uh, any potential damages that your pet might cause. Um, you might also have renter's insurance, which we discussed earlier, that covers your stuff. It does not cover the property. There's also other moving expenses, which can really add up to quite a bit. So for instance, if you need to hire someone to help you move or multiple people to help you move, uh, you might need to rent a truck or a storage unit. Um, these are all things that can cost hundreds of dollars, especially if you're moving across country or even like just a few hours away. And then you might also have new furniture costs. Um, so for instance, if your new place doesn't come furnished, you might need to buy something to furnish your home if you don't already have them. And those costs can really add up as well. Yeah, I can speak to a, a few of these different experiences. Like, you know, in our recent move, we moved three hours and, you know, you got to get a truck. We ended up like having to get movers uh, in our apartment that we moved out of and then in our apartment that we moved to. Um, and that, that all adds up. And then anytime, like sometimes even if you have furniture already, it may not fit your new place. Like you might be downsizing or moving to a bigger place. And like, if you have a, a couch that fits like a small apartment, you might need a, a couch that fits a bigger apartment when you, when you move to a new place. But the good thing about furniture is like, as long as you have, you know, kind of your basic needs met, you can do the rest of that slowly if you need to. So it's important to be aware of all these costs and be prepared for them when you're ready to move. Often moving costs or fees will be due at the signing of the lease, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and it may occur while you're still paying rent somewhere else. So those are costs that might be difficult to manage if you aren't prepared for them when they become due. Yeah, definitely. Like you might sign a lease the month before you move out or of your, you know, your current apartment, if you're, you know, going from one rental to another. So you might already having to pay rent for that month in your one unit and then have to pay all these other fees of cost up front too, before you move into your new, your new place. Um, so, but now we want to talk a little bit about the difference between renting and buying. Um, so I'll ask our two homeowners again, what were some of the big differences that you notice when you transition from uh, renting to owning? Um, I'll, I'll go first this time. So for, for me, like I said, I, I rented in college. So there were a lot of things different from being in college and then like having a job <laughs> and like getting up and going to work. Um, but for one thing I really want to talk about too, and this is this is not only just renting, but also my cousin and I owned a town home together and not a home. And when my bigger transition, I almost feel like was when I went from being in a town home to being in a home, because a town home is a little bit like renting in, in terms of like, I didn't have to cut the grass. I didn't have to rake leaves. I didn't have to shovel snow. Like the town home and our association took care of all of that. Um, I mean, we did have to like get our own repair guys and, and, and things like that, that may, you know, have broken, but um, the yard and like everything around that had to do with like the outside of the house like that, that was a, it still is a big transition. I feel like to owning your own home. Cause now that's all on you. And, um, that's definitely something to weigh when you're looking at, uh, what you want to do. I know for my cousin and I, when we lived in the town home together, um, we didn't mind paying our association dues because we never had to shovel snow. <laughs> Honestly, Nikki, I didn't even think about that when we were prepping for this podcast until you mentioned it, maybe because like when I was growing up, I always had to help my parents with like lawn maintenance and that kind of stuff. And even when I lived with my friends, I helped with shoveling, 
I helped with raking leaves and mowing, though I had to do it a lot less often because there were more people to share share the opportunities for lawn mowing, for instance. Um, but that's definitely something to consider, especially if you don't like doing it. Which, by the way, I do not. I understand that there are people out there who like love gardening and like that is their thing. And I respect those people. And I wish I even had like an inkling of it because then it wouldn't be (laughs) such torture for me. (laughs) But I just, it's just not my thing. So it, I, you know, that's, that is a really big aspect of home ownership that I think, um, you know, people, do, and for rightful reasons, people concentrate, can you afford it? And, you know, mortgage payments and down payments and things like that. And that is a hundred percent very important and more important. But if you determine that you could afford it, this is just another piece of the puzzle. I think that is just something to think of. And there are costs with that, that you may not be used to paying. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I- if you, you also got to think about like, if you have the time to manage the, the yard maintenance itself, how big is your yard? How much time does it take? How fast does it grow? Um, especially if like you travel a lot for work, will you have to contract with someone to manage it when you're not there? For instance, even if you love doing it, if you can't always be there to do it when it has, cause it has to be done on the time frame. Otherwise, it gets all crazy. It's very difficult to deal with. I guess from my perspective, going from renting to owning a home, it was a little bit of a lifestyle shift. And I I thought about it from the perspective of like having my own space and making it mine. You can't really do that as well. Like I was able to paint all the walls and do updates that I wanted. And especially during this pandemic, I really appreciated having my own outside space that I could be in, especially during lockdown, where I had control over what that outside space was. And I I did not take that for granted, especially in the last couple of years. Um, Not that like I am the best gardener because I am not, but I appreciated having that space to control and um, just be able to enjoy. And there are certain things that I don't like about um, home ownership as much. For instance, when something goes wrong, it comes out of my pocket. I'm the one that has to call the people. For instance, a few years ago, the overhang over my front door started detaching from the front of the house. And we just happened to notice it while backing out of the driveway. And I was like, why does it look like the overhang is going to fall off of the front of the house? And so I go and I look at it. You could see light coming through the front of the house and the overhang. And I had to scramble to find someone to remove it because I couldn't do it by myself. I couldn't do it with just my husband. It needed to have a contractor that knew what they were doing. And it was at least a four person job to take it down. Um, but it was a a safety risk as well. I didn't want like my postal worker coming up and getting crushed by this huge disaster on the front of my house. Um, I also like my fridge went out last summer, so I had to pay for that replacement, but you had to do a new HVAC system, HVAC system. I think I'm, I think I'm sensing a a common theme here is that one of the big I think, uh, I think one of the big differences, and we're going to talk about a lot of them, but one of the big differences is kind of that like sense of personal responsibility. Like when you own this land and home, you know, that becomes like a big responsibility that you have to take on. Um, you know, I can relate to the, the lawn maintenance and the, the shoveling, you know, about when I was, uh, as soon as I was old enough to push a lawnmower, that, that job fell to me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, so I remember doing that or even like helping out around the neighborhood and getting paid a little bit on the side when I was younger to like mow some lawns or shovel some driveways. Um, even if you're renting, I know like one fun thing about the city of Chicago is that you you park on a street and it snows a lot, then you have to shovel your car out. So, um, you're not always gone from that, but yeah, typically like if you're renting and the fridge in your apartment breaks, like that's going to be on your landlord to fix it. There are 
you know, some, the flip side of that is if like, you don't have a very good landlord or someone who like is not attentive to that things, like you aren't fixing it yourself. Like you don't, you might not have the same urgency to fix the problem that you yourself might have. Um, and so that can be frustrating as a renter too, but obviously the financial burden of fixing those things is much different when, if, when you're renting versus buying. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different stuff there. And like I said, we're going to break down some of these differences right now, and I'm sure that we're going to miss some. Um, so I'll say again, this list is probably not exhaustive, uh, but I think these are the ones to kind of, the main ones to consider as a factor for people when they're considering whether to rent or buy. So saving for the down payment is a big one. Down payment is like a very, is a large expense for people. You know, it can be like saving, you know, thousands of dollars um, to be able to purchase a home. There are upfront moving costs when you move into a rental, but they're typically not as large as like a down payment. So that's a big one. Another thing to think about is like fixed costs versus rent changes. So we're going to talk about the difference in different types of mortgages on another episode, but often mortgages can have a fixed monthly payment, especially over the long term. Like you might have a 15 year mortgage or a 30 year mortgage and your mortgage payment is going to be the same over the duration of that mortgage if you have a fixed mortgage payment. But there's other things to consider as well, like your property taxes can go up or down. There's a lot of other things that go into like a, an S, like a mortgage, a whole mortgage payment that might make the cost go up or down um, from month to month or year to year. Any of that stuff, like your insurance can get more expensive. Um, so those things can all fluctuate, but like a mortgage payment is going to be if you are in a fixed term and you have like those fixed monthly payments in your, in your mortgage is going to be pretty consistent over the cost of the mortgage, but something with rent to consider is that like things happen in the economy, rent can get more expensive. Like your landlord can increase it from year to year, or like even from lease to lease. So like you might not even be in a year long lease. You might be in a six month lease. And at the end of that six months, the landlord could say, Hey, like I got a new property assessment and this property is worth such and such more. The rent's going up here, et cetera, et cetera. So in general, this isn't always the case. There's like variable mortgage payments that can go up and down too um, with like different interests and stuff. But I would say in general, if you have a fixed mortgage, then your payment over the long term is going to be somewhat consistent with renting. You kind of are at the mercy of your landlord and like different economic factors on whether or not your rent is going to increase like dramatically or something. Uh, another consideration when renting and buying is property taxes versus no property taxes. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, if you own a home, you're going to have to pay property taxes on the property that you own. If you are renting, you won't have to. Another thing to consider is I'm going to say like quote unquote planting roots versus being less tied down when you're owning versus renting. If you're at a point in your life where you're moving a lot or unsure if you want to stay in one place, renting might be a better option for you. Or just like if you like the flexibility of not being tied to one place, if you want to bounce around from city to city, a lot of people are working from home right now and they might not want to move to new areas or do things like that. Um, renting might be a better option for you because you're not as specifically tied to like one location or a permanent home. Um, whereas like if you own a home, of course you can sell that home and move to a new location, but you know, that's probably a longer process that comes with a lot more to it than just like getting out of a lease or like moving at the end of a lease. Um, so that's what I say when like you buy something, you kind of plant roots because you're making yourself a little bit more stationary. So if you are like in a point in your life where you want to move around or do things like that, renting might be a better option for you. If you're at a point in your life where you kind of want to stay in one place, buying might be a better option for you as well. And this is a big one that like Nikki and Andrea both talked about, but being responsible for home repairs or things that go wrong or like the lawn care and maintenance. If you own a home, you obviously have to fix it when something breaks. It, when you're renting, that responsibility falls on the landlord instead of you. Uh, if you're renting like a house with a yard, you may actually need to do the lawn care maintenance or it might be offered by the landlord. Sometimes like may, you might even, if you like doing that, you could offer it to the landlord. They might even cut some of your rent off or something for a service like that. Um, but it's important to look at the lease. Like sometimes they might require you of you as well. Um, but you got to definitely make sure that's like clarified in the lease whose responsibility it is to deal with the lawn care. 
And then this is the last one that's also kind of big. We talked about this on the home buying episode, but having home equity, uh, a big part of building wealth. And um, I would argue specifically like generational wealth that carries over from like, you know, generation to generation is owning a home and having that home equity that you can borrow against and do a lot of other things with. Um, if that's a goal of yours, then you should definitely consider buying or like starting to save to buy a home. Um, but the factors that impact building home equity um, the most include time in the home and whether or not the property appreciates or depreciates over time, which is can be hard to gauge. But that is a factor. If that's like a goal of yours to to someday have home equity, then you might want to consider like starting to get on the path of home ownership rather than like continually renting. We also want to talk about some of the issues that might come up with renting. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have seen millions of renters across the country struggle to make payments as they were laid off from work or had to transition to new jobs. The, gover the government, both state and federal government, stepped in and instituted in in eviction moratoriums over the last couple of years and helped to set up programs to aid renters who fell behind on payments. Uh, these policies varied widely depending on which state you lived in. Um, but for us personally here in Illinois, our eviction moratorium ended in October of 2021. However, qualified renters in Illinois can still get up to $25,000 or 18 months of emergency rental payments if they fell behind on rent due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So if that is um, sounds like you, if you're listening, uh, we will include some links in the show notes that, that can take you um, to the right location to, to find if you qualify and how, how to get that. Thank you, Nikki. I think that's really important because people are still struggling. Um, besides what Nikki mentioned, we also want to highlight resources for renters outside of pandemic related issues. So in a perfect world, you never want to have any problems with your unit or landlord when you're renting. But unfortunately, it, it doesn't always work out that way, as Jake kind of alluded to in his situation earlier. Um, but here are some additional resources that we can link in the show notes if you're having issues with your rental situation. Uh, the federal government has a whole department, the Housing and Urban Development, uh, that has rental assistance resource pages and additional um, housing and resources as well. It's even, um, you can look at it by state. There's also the state housing regulator within Illinois. It's called the Illinois Housing Development Authority or IDHA, which we can link to in the show notes. There are other local housing authorities, for example, the Chicago Housing Authority. Um, for students, since that's who I typically work with, a lot of campuses that have rental resources like campus tenant unions or for instance in uh, Urbana-Champaign, there's the off-campus community living department on campus that can help you with issues you have with your landlords or understanding leases. There's also some campuses have um, student legal services as well, which leads us to pro bono legal assistance that might be available for renters elsewhere. So in certain cases, you might be able to find lawyers that will help renters pro bono, meaning that they donate their expertise for free and HUD or the Housing and Urban Development uh, office that we talked about earlier has a list of legal assistance options in Illinois too, which we can link to. And then of course, I'm all about watching for scams. The Federal Trade Commission has a whole article on how to avoid rental scams. So to summarize everything up kind of nicely, um, secure housing is definitely an important step in managing your finances and your budget. And since many people aren't in a position to buy a home or may not want to, uh, many rent their housing, uh, understandably so. So we hope this episode was able to shed some light on the process of securing a rental home and the differences between renting and buying for those that are making that decision.
Next time we're going to continue our housing series and talk about different types of mortgages you can get when you're trying to buy a home. So be sure to stay tuned for that one. Also be, sh- be sure to subscribe to the pod on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Spotify. And as always, thanks for listening.